Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on alternative payment methods showcasing the uh, Dutch experiences. Also welcome to those who are uh, watching uh, this session uh, later on, watching the, uh, the recording. So just to make you aware that all sessions are recorded and of course this enables all of us to watch also the sessions that normally at a normal conference we would miss. I'm uh, Eric van Rij. I'm a professor of purchasing and supply management in healthcare at the Erasmus University Rotterdam, affiliated both with the business school, Rotterdam School of Management, and the Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management. And for this presentation, I chose to use the slide layout of the business school because it has this beautiful picture of Rotterdam on the first slide. And uh, you can even see Erasmus Medical Center right here uh, in the middle of the picture, that uh, white uh, new uh, uh, building, or actually set of buildings. So, um, of course, we would have loved to um, have you here in Rotterdam, a city I was not born in, but I'm actually extremely proud of that I now live in Rotterdam. And uh, Rotterdam, of course, has a lot of references to uh, Desiderius Erasmus, who was born here but uh, didn't live in the city actually for very long. Uh, he died in Basel in Switzerland. He traveled a lot. Uh, and of course, as you know, he was a great student in classical languages, philosophy, and all kinds of other uh, subjects. A lot of references to uh, Erasmus as a person. He's the name giver of the Erasmus Medical Center um, with a couple of brand new buildings. It's a beautiful complex, also won an architectural prize. It also gave a name to a bridge, the Erasmus Bridge. I'm sure if you would have visited Rotterdam, you would have gone and have a look at this beautiful bridge, also called the Swan. And it is the name giver to our university. You actually see his signature on the central square of the Erasmus University uh, Rotterdam. This is approximately the view from the building that I, uh, I work in. Rotterdam also, of course, known for its port, the biggest port of Europe. Um, before the rise of China, uh, I think it was the biggest port of the world, at least. Uh, it's still a very large port, and what you see also here is that we reclaim land from the sea in order to be able to grow the port, and that's what you, uh, what you also see on this picture. You would have also probably visited a couple of museums, at least I would hope you would do. In the background, actually, again, Rotterdam Medical Center, but in the front, the large new construction made out of mirrors, is of the Boymans van Beuningen Museum, one of the larger museums here uh, in the city. And if you would have gone to Rotterdam, you would have also seen that uh, this is a city with a very diverse population. Uh, more than 50% of the population of Rotterdam, uh, if you look back one, two or three generations, is not originally from Dutch uh, descent. We could say maybe it's the most diverse city uh, of Rotterdam. Um, also, uh, quite large disparities between social economic statuses, which also means that it has a quite special profile in terms of the healthcare that uh, Rotterdam needs. And uh, large differences also in life expectancy. Uh, there's a very interesting project where someone has taken the metro lines of Rotterdam and then depicted at every stop of the metro line what the life expectancy in that local neighborhood is. And it gives you a an interesting picture of the big differences in life expectancy. That's it about Rotterdam. Uh, on to, the, to, to Holland as a, and the Dutch healthcare sector, sector very quickly. Here you see the rising healthcare expenses. We uh, are crossing the 100 billion euros per year line. So this is not entirely going in the right direction because that raises a lot of questions about the financial sustainability of the system. But at the same time, uh, consumers think that the quality of healthcare in our country is very high. You see the scores of the European Consumer Healthcare Index, and uh, only Switzerland uh, has a higher uh, uh, grade given by, by consumers. So at the same time, as it is an expensive system, it's also considered a very high quality system. And part of the high expenses is particularly because of long-term care. Uh, within the OECD, we are number one when it comes to the percentage of GDP spent on long-term care, uh, a large part of it also being elderly care. This raises questions about, does our system work? 
And as in many other countries with a purchaser provider split, we have these important triadic relationships between the providers of healthcare, the citizens or patients that uh, at some point in time will use the healthcare and the purchasers of healthcare. And of course, in the middle, uh, government and regulation uh, trying to manage this system of what we call regulated competition. And that's also what this session is about. We have speakers that represent these purchasers, in this case, insurance companies in the Dutch system. Uh, we also have speakers that look at the perspective of uh, regulation uh, as, as uh, uh, institutes that represent or advise the government or are part of regulatory bodies. Uh, and we also have a perspective from science. We will be talking about payment. And uh, of course, uh, at, at the end of the game, the, uh, the Dutch population pays for its healthcare. Uh, as citizens or patients or insurees, we pay taxes, we pay insurance premiums, and we have to do co-payments. And so these go in all directions of this, of this graph. And then also the government, of course, funds uh, healthcare in part. They sometimes directly uh, fund uh, purchasers. For instance, the risk equalization scheme in our country has this role, and they sometimes directly fund, fund providers. But of course, we also talk about purchasing, where uh, these purchasers in the system, they fund providers via the claims that the providers send in to these purchasers. So this is the general picture. And our healthcare is actually governed by uh, different laws. And I'll pick out three very quickly, the three laws that govern the largest parts of our healthcare system. And uh, in order of how much we spend, the Health Insurance Act, within this act, the most or the largest part of healthcare expenses are, are being paid. And we see the full picture here. As insurees, we pay premiums to insurance companies. We pay, and also employers, by the way, pay taxes to the government. And of course, we have sometimes co-payments directly to providers. For instance, if healthcare is not covered by insurance, we have the insurers paying on the basis of claims. We also have the government with certain money streams to purchasers, the insurance companies, and to providers. We have a long-term care act. And as you can guess from my previous slides, also a lot of money is going on in this part of the system. And then the purchaser is not an insurance company, but a regional care office, but in fact, they are run by our insurance companies. So there is a big relationship with our insurance companies in the Netherlands. The picture is a bit uh, simpler because most of it is paid via taxes and is then going to these uh, care offices. And again, there is a purchasing process leading to a financial stream from the purchasers to the providers. The third act, also an important one, social support. Uh, here, the municipalities are the purchasing bodies in our system. Um, we pay municipal taxes, we pay state taxes, and both end up with these municipalities via a certain government-run fund. And these purchasers uh, pay the providers, again, based on the purchasing processes and the contracts uh, that are made between purchasers and providers. If I zoom in on the insurance part, because that's the largest part of the healthcare system, we see uh, national and regional insurance companies. There's always uh, the big four, but over the past couple of years, the smaller insurance companies are actually growing faster uh, percentage-wise than the, than the bigger insurance companies, but we still have a big four. And in the, uh, the, the map of the Netherlands, you see in which municipalities which insurance companies has the largest market share. So again, the big four are recognizable, but we also have uh, the regional insurance companies that in some municipalities are actually the largest uh, insurer. So our, our landscape is one of four large insurance companies and some smaller ones. We're going to talk about uh, payment methods. Of course, there are traditional ones and more newer or alternative payment methods. And uh, we use a lot of more traditional payment methods in our country, as a capitation, for instance, or general practitioners. A lot of it is fee-for-service or DRG-based. Uh, there is also some global budgeting uh, going on. 
and uh, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, these rates are per diem and, and risk adjusted. It depends on where uh, we are in the healthcare system. Many contracts are one-year contracts, but we certainly see a development towards multi-year contracting. And what's also important to understand, uh, if you're not uh, uh, Dutch, you might not uh, uh, know about this phenomenon, but since 2012, the Dutch government has intervened, in my view, quite strongly, making nationwide agreements on how much the macro budget of healthcare is allowed to grow. And we're talking about uh, small percentages and uh, at some point it should be 0% uh, real growth in healthcare expenses. But there are also uh, interesting experiments. That's what this session is about. We will hear about bundled payments, uh, but also uh, integrated payments across multiple providers. Uh, what we also see in the Netherlands is multi-year budgets where the year-on-year -year growth is, is managed by the, by the purchaser value-based payments, outcome-based payments, shared savings, and there's also experiments with population-based agreements. Of course, the corona crisis has led to some uh, special uh, purchasing going on this year and next year. And uh, yeah, th this also has a big impact. In today's presentations, uh, the corona crisis will not uh, feature uh, very largely, but of course, uh, some of the speakers may refer to it. We're also going to discuss how in normal times uh, the Dutch are experimenting with alternative payment methods. So we have five speakers. Um, first of all, uh, Professor Misha Mikers, who is a professor at Tilburg University, but also, and that's his perspective mostly for his presentation, he's a chief economist at the Dutch Healthcare Authority, and that is one of the regulatory bodies in our system followed by uh, Dr. Jeroen Struis, uh, Associate Professor at Leiden University Medical Center and Senior Researcher at one of the Dutch advisory bodies, uh, a national body for health and environment. And he will talk about bundled payments for maternity care, followed by Dr. Mare Tanke. She will take the perspective of one of the four large insurance companies, in this case, uh, VGZ, talking about how they uh, attempt to uh, manage and enable care transformations and also uh, moving healthcare out of the hospital and to uh, uh, less expensive parts of the healthcare system. Dr. Arthur Haaien, who uh, is a senior intelligence analyst at Mensis, also one of the big four insurance companies and also works for Leiden University Medical Center. And finally, Frank Eikenaar, my colleague from the Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management taking a uh, scientific perspective and looking at lessons from alternative payment methods in the Netherlands. So this was my introduction. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will invite uh, Misha Mikkers to take over for his presentation. Or maybe very quickly, please uh, pose your questions in the chat. I will monitor the chat. Uh, if I see anything that needs to be answered directly, I'll try to uh, intervene, but I'd like to keep most of the questions uh, to the end of the session because we will not fill the whole session with these presentations and there will be some time for Q&A at the end. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, uh, Eric. Um, let me start uh, by uh, saying that um, our, uh, uh, if you look at different healthcare systems as you uh, started your presentation as well with, that I would say that uh, regardless of the system you have, you have um, more or less the same uh, trends uh, in most of the indicators that we um, can uh, look at. Um, and secondly, that all these trends uh, seem not to be uh, affected uh, by the way you organized your system. So uh, we, uh, you explained our system uh, uh, having a, a purchaser uh, provider uh, split and uh, uh, characterized our system as regulated competition while well, you could not say the same for the UK for example and Sweden where they have a more uh, government uh, steered uh, system. Um, the way the system is organized does not seem to matter too much for the outcomes. I just have here two outcomes, uh, hospital cost per capita and 30-day uh, uh, mortality after admission for hospital uh, for an acute myocardial infarction. 
And basically what, what you see is that the trends in all these countries are the same. So the problem is uh, slightly deeper uh, than uh, the way the system is organized. It's basically uh, the way we uh, pay for providers and for the healthcare that they provide. Uh, and in most cases, I think uh, that uh, uh, payments are too fragmented uh, and sometimes we pay for production and sometimes we pay for uh, the budget, uh, which gives a wrong incentives uh, for uh, the volume of healthcare. If you look at the challenge in the Netherlands, why we have to change these payment systems, I just have here two arbitrary uh, indicators again left you see uh, the percentage of the population with a BMI over 30, which is uh, obese, uh, at different education levels, and you see this rising over time, and uh, the institute where Jeroen Strauss works um, uh, uh, estimates that this uh, increase will uh, go on until 2040, which also leads to a lot of healthcare costs, which you see in the, in the right a graph where the black line is the projected healthcare cost of 2015 and uh, the bars are, the blue and the red bars are the projected healthcare cost um, uh, in 2014. So you see a huge increase in healthcare cost. And um, I don't personally, I don't think that the healthcare cost is, a, is the major issue here. Uh, the major issue here will be the accessibility of healthcare because long before uh, healthcare uh, becomes too uh, expensive, uh, the, the system will not be organizable uh, uh, anymore because of shortage of staff. Already now we face a large, large shortage of staff, uh, especially nurses and, nurses and doctors. Um, and if the demand of healthcare uh, and the production of healthcare is going on like it is, um, accessibility uh, uh, will not be, uh, cannot be guaranteed anymore. So there are large challenges and this is also why we have this debate over other payment methods. So what are these uh, developments? So currently we pay in many countries uh, fee for service in com combination for budgets, uh, as Eric also indicated. Uh, we pay fragmented uh, monodisciplinary uh, payments per sector. We have incentives for too much or too little healthcare or at the wrong places. And we pay for illness and not for health. So we have to go to payments that go uh, for added value. Also other speakers will uh, say something about this. Uh, for integral healthcare, which uh, includes, uh, to my opinion, also the social context, the social domain. Uh, we should address multimorbidity. Uh, we, there should be much more attention for prevention. Uh, and for the social context, as I indicated. So these are uh, uh, important issues uh, uh, in, the, in the future. And this change uh, should not only uh, 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 be applied to the payment models, as we will discuss today, but it will also uh, lead to a different culture and a different organization of healthcare. To speak about uh, uh, different uh, culture, um, we can and should learn much more uh, from the data that we assemble. If you look at uh, other experiences in other countries and also the experience, experiences that we are facing now, we can see that we can learn a lot from the data. In many cases, data are just used. There is a lot of data assembled and um, stored, but it's mainly used uh, to evaluate and to help one client. We don't learn about groups. And especially we could learn about potential avoidable complications. Um, there are many people that come to, for example, to an emergency uh, care unit of a hospital that should not be, should not be there if uh, uh, we did something else uh, previous to the hospitalization. For example, um, uh, which is uh, uh, an actual example, uh, if people uh, uh, adhere to uh, the norms, uh, social distance norms, for example, we should have less uh, uh, hospitalizations for uh, uh, the coronavirus. 
if people do not get obese, uh, we should have less people uh, having uh, medical treatment for uh, diabetes. Um, in my opinion, uh, there should be also different governments. Should, uh, for example, there should much be much more cooperation, especially vertical, uh, uh, with the different healthcare providers. Uh, for example, between uh, GPs and hospitals, uh, but also with the social domain. Uh, I will uh, show you later on uh, some experiments that are running in the Netherlands. But for example, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, we look at people that uh, visit em emergency care units uh, uh, with uh, 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 pain on the uh, breast, uh, that, that, uh, but they don't, don't get treated for heart problems because they are not ill. M mostly they are stressed people because uh, they have, for example, uh, debts. So they should be kind of uh, uh, helped in the social domain and not go to uh, the emergency care unit. A different organization and more cooperation will probably also, and other payment methods will probably also lead to a different, diff, different governments. And what I mean by that is uh, that the contract pa partners uh, are different and there should be uh, different government govern governance. Uh, 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 a governance should be differently organized. There are a lot, a lot of questions. Who should be the contract partner? Uh, how, do the, how do these contract partners uh, uh, interact with each other? Should they form a corporation? Should they uh, merge into one big company, which also raises issues with, with uh, competition and other governance issues? The different payment models, which will be the issue of this uh, uh, session today, will should take into account information asymmetry and incentive compatibility. So the incentives uh, should be uh, that uh, the right amount of care is given at the right uh, uh, patient by the right provider. So uh, people should not go uh, to the hospital uh, for things that they should not, uh, they could be treated, for example, in the social domain or prevent stuff. Um, so there are lots of experiments uh, that the uh, Dutch Healthcare Authority is in, involved in. Here you see a small map of the Netherlands uh, where we are involved. Uh, and if you remember uh, the map by er er Eric, you also can imagine that in all these regions, different insurers are uh, affiliated with the experiments. All these experiments uh, are in a different uh, state, have different aims of uh, where, they are, uh, where they are now. Uh, experiments that are kind of uh, worth mentioning is Beter Samen in Noord in Amsterdam. Uh, uh, it's a very promising experiment where we try to learn from data uh, who, who, uh, where healthcare can be prevented by promoting health, especially in the social domain. Participants there are all healthcare providers, so the hospitals, GPs, mental health care, elderly care, home care, uh, uh, financing uh, organizations like insurers, the municipality, and uh, the regional healthcare office. Um, so all uh, uh, participants are involved uh, there, and we try to set up their uh, an organization uh, uh, and governance that uh, enhances payments between providers to prevent as much healthcare as we can. Uh, another uh, uh, experiment worth mentioning is Den Haag, Gezond en Gelukkig Den Haag, uh, uh, where Jeroen Struis is also affiliated uh, from. Uh, 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 as part of uh, the Leiden University Medical uh, Center. Um, and there actually uh, he managed to combine all the data of all providers uh, and municipality at the Dutch uh, Statistical Office. So we can use these data to analyze and uh, target groups um, uh, to uh, uh, get better healthcare and more integral. You have uh, 10 minutes, Misha. Yes. Um, so, uh, as a regulator, we are involved in all these experiments. Uh, we help with the data analysis. 
uh, we enable uh, groups to, to participate and we allow to uh, uh, bend the rules uh, if necessary for the goals. Uh, so uh, we are actively participating in these experiments. By no means I would like to say that these are all payment experiments that are going on. These are just the payment models uh, that are going on uh, that the NZA is involved in. And secondly, I would like to stress that one of the big virtues of the Dutch healthcare system is, is that we have this decentralized nature as Eric indicated in his introduction, which makes this experimentation possible. Common elements of all these experiments is, is that we speak about integral care. So we speak about bundles and populations, uh, uh, also something uh, Eric mentioned. Um, it measures health uh, and health status of uh, uh, citizens. Uh, and uh, it's about multi-year contracts. Unfortunately, no, none of the experiments I showed have already uh, these contracts ready. Um, and these contracts involve uh, risk sharing between payers and providers. And um, so what I would like to say is that in all systems, these ch changes are comparable. Unfortunately, there is no blueprint. So experimentation is needed, which is possible in the Dutch system, uh, uh, which is a nice feature. Um, and these experiments uh, should um, uh, uh, have, have the topic of integral and coordinated healthcare. Uh, uh, it should be data driven. Uh, an element is debundled payments. Uh, and to prevent under or over treatment, we should somehow correct the payments for outcome indicators, how insufficient they are. And I guess Frank uh, will also say something about uh, that because that's his specialty. Um, Prevention avoidable complications are important elements. So we should prevent people going uh, to uh, consume uh, expensive healthcare when not needed. Uh, and therefore payment for value uh, uh, is the ultimate goal, which we, I guess we will not achieve, but this is like the goal we should uh, strive for. I guess I made it within 12 minutes, uh, Erik. Just about so. And uh, thank you very much, Misha. Nice to see this uh, perspective from the country as a whole. And for the next presentation, we're going to deep dive into one specific uh, experiment regarding maternity care. Jeroen, it's yours. Um, I'm Jeroen Strauss. I'm working for the National Institute of Public Health and for Leiden University Medical Center. Um, my research is uh, mostly on designing, implementing and evaluating alternative payment models. Uh, Eric asked me to talk about uh, the Dutch uh, uh, maternity care uh, uh, model, uh, bundled payments for maternity care, and I will a little bit explain that. Uh, before I explain the model, I will go a little bit back conceptually, uh, why actually are we implementing alternative payment model and what, is and what is the problem if we still are in a fee-for-service world? Is there a problem if we are in a fee-for-service world? And conceptually, actually, it's quite clear what we want to aim. Um, and that is that we have a certain system goal uh, in the Netherlands. It's, it's about uh, quality of care, it's about access, uh, accessibility, it's about uh, uh, finance sustainability. And within that system, to reach that goal, we have a certain providers in the system. And, and there is actually some kind of a misalignment in most of the cases between the incentive the, the different provider in their roles perceive versus the system goals we have. And Actually, and conceptually, the only thing APMs are trying to do is, is to align the system goals we have with the incentives they perceive in daily practice. Um, so actually, the, the challenge is on how can we design alternative payment models in such a way that they are more aligned with the overarching system goals. And in the way we do that is that we shift a, a risk of accountability from payers towards providers. And when you look to this graph, it might be a little conceptually a bit difficult, but in the end, what, what the blue line and the red line here, and we, if we are still in a fee-for-service world, then the blue line is having actually most of the financial risk. So in this case, the payer here is bearing the financial risk. And by shifting to the right in the figure, we shift financial accountability and related risk from payers towards providers. 
And by doing so, actually, we give providers uh, actually to give an incentive to, collo to collaborate more, to reduce overuse, to reduce underuse, to avoid uh, duplicated services, etc. So actually, uh, they get a, a, some kind of an incentive um, to produce more value uh, uh, for the system. And this is actually conceptually what we are uh, doing with alternative payment models. And there is an, um, a, a framework for alternative payment models. Um, and we have uh, different models, uh, uh, shared saving bundles. And I think it's, it's very, very necessary that we all have the same uh, concepts in mind. So uh, when, when I read uh, the, the scientific literature, when they talk about bundles, uh, when they talk about shared savings models, question yourself, what, what are they talking about? And is it really a bundle or is it really a shared savings model? Um, and I think in most of the cases, uh, uh, people are talking, I don't know, about global budgets or they are talking about uh, uh, a bundled payment while it's a, a shared savings model, et cetera. So I think um, a little bit of um, talking with the same voice, understanding the concept is uh, uh, quite important. Um, I know Arthur Heyer uh, later on will talk about a shared savings models. I will now talk um, um, about a, a capitated uh, a model, a bundled payment, for maternity care. Um, if you're really interested about bundled payments, um, I, I just finished last year uh, a systematic review on all alternative payment models we can find in, in scientific literature, uh, specifically focused so on category for population-based uh, uh, population uh, bundled payment models. Um, I don't talk about that one today. So the whole idea uh, when, when we go to the bundled payment for maternity care in the Netherlands is that, uh, um, that we have a, a, a health insurer who contracts what we now call uh, an integrated maternity act or organization that's some kind of a general contractor. So um, uh, um, the insurer has a contract with the IMCO and the IMCO subcontracts the, the, uh, the providers he did. So in that case, actually we leave um, the fee-for-service architecture that we have uh, uh, normally spoken. Normally spoken, there is a direct relationship between the insurer and the providers who deliver the primary, uh, the, the primary care, I'm oh, sorry, the, the care in, in the primary process. But now we have some kind of a general contract in between who is signing the contract and at the end uh, subcontracting the other providers. So he uh, at the end takes over the financial risk and uh, the accountability and related risk uh, and subcontracts uh, he needs. And by doing so and coming back to the uh, presentation of uh, uh, Misha, in that sense, the information asymmetry, what's normally here between insurer and providers is actually in a large extent diminished. So the, the IMCO, the Integrated Maternity Care uh, Organization is owned by providers. So it's a combination of the midwives, hospital, gynecologists, and uh, what we have called uh, in the Netherlands of some kind of after delivery uh, uh, maternity assistance. So they know exactly what happens and they, having, uh, they will do the purchasing at, at the end uh, for the package day uh, uh, contract. So we have the bundled payment and um, it's actually from the first concept, it's quite clear. So you have one fixed fee for the whole package. So uh, when we go back to maternity care, it's from the pregnancy when it starts. So the first contact with your maternity care provider uh, in Netherlands is mostly it's a midwife in primary care. That's the trigger point for uh, the bundle. And it actually ends after uh, um, after delivery and a week after when we have the home assistance. Uh, um, and uh, conceptually that is, so you have one fixed fee for the whole package. Um, and that appeared a little bit too difficult, too much risk uh, uh, for uh, the, uh, the integrated, for the IMCOs, for the inter uh, integrated maternity care organizations. And, and uh, so we have a little bit of a split and you, know, you can question, do we really have a bundled payment in our model, yes or no? And we have a split between prenatal, natal, and postnatal. Uh, and every pregnancy, um, when it's a normal pregnancy, so uh, the IMCO will uh, send a bill towards insurer uh, uh, about a prenatal module, uh, the natal module also regular, and the postnatal uh, regular. So then at the end, the reimbursement builds up of those uh, different uh, uh, modules. If it's more complex, 
uh, we will have a regular a prenatal, then we have a complex here and uh, we might have a complex here. So it's a little bit risk adjusted. So we have at the end nine different modules um, uh, in which the, uh, the bundle is uh, uh, paid off. Uh, and that's conceptually at the end uh, how it works. So we have six regions in the Netherlands who started in 2017 uh, with that experiment. Uh, and at the moment, uh, we just finished a report uh, about uh, some uh, mm, uh, yeah, quantitative uh, analysis about it. And the question is at the end, uh, does those three uh, of those six uh, IMCOs at the end will end up with uh, what, what is the impact on utilization? What is the impact on health outcomes? And what is the impact on, on spending? Um, we also do uh, quite a lot of qualitative uh, work in the sense of what are the experience of all, in, uh, of all actors? Uh, is the collaboration what we hope for? Uh, is it, uh, what is the mechanism? Does it work? Um, do we think that the incentive we theoretically are there? Um, do we reduce uh, overuse? Do we reuse underuse? Do we have some kind of a right incentive to, to deliver the care at the right place if it's possible within primary care? Is it still in primary care or is, it, is there still an incentive to go to the uh, secondary care? Yes or no? Um, but I will just very briefly show you um, uh, the quantitative uh, analysis. Um, what we have done for that is that we are quite lucky in the Netherlands that we have Statistic Netherlands, which can serve as a trusted third party in which we can uh, combine all, uh, all nationwide registration. So we have an, uh, an all-payer claims data uh, based in the Netherlands called Factus. We can send it to Statistic Netherlands. We have a nationwide registration, the midwife and gynecologist. We send it to uh, a Statistic Netherlands and we can, uh, after um, uh, the anonymization process, we can link them on the individual level. So we have a, a nationwide cohort um, over the years from 2000 till 2019 uh, with all the data on uh, uh, on the individual level and we can enrich them with all the uh, social uh, characteristics like income, ethnicity, etc. Um, so actually we are quite lucky in the Netherlands that we have uh, uh, a quite nice uh, database. Uh, You're now applied, at 10 minutes, Jeroen. Yes, we applied a, a difference in difference design, conceptually quite clear. Uh, we have a control group, we have an intervention group and we have a pre-intervention period and a post-intervention period. Uh, most important is that we have a parallel trend in the pre-intervention period. Um, because we have a, a, a lot of data, uh, we can do some uh, machine learning techniques to select uh, uh, quite nicely uh, some good control groups. And we just look to the pre-intervention, uh, uh, where there is the assumption there, yes or no. In summary, we see some small changes already in the early stages. So it, it is the data for 2018 and sometimes a little bit all, uh, on outcomes already on 2019. So it's, 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 it's early, uh, but even then we see some small changes in utilization. Here you see the, uh, the place of birth. Uh, we see a shift towards po um, uh, um, polyclinic deliveries outside of the hospital. Um, we see a smaller spending growth in the IMCOs compared to the control groups. Um, but, um, and we see that the effect is not only uh, in one of the IMCOs, but we uh, um, looked at the different six uh, regions and actually we see in four of the six, uh, we see uh, the same effect. So that gives us an indication that the effect uh, might be related uh, to the alternative payment model, uh, but we see no difference in health outcomes uh, uh, yet, or we will never will uh, see those. Uh, we don't know yet. Um, at the moment, um, the Ministry of Health, uh, the minister will decide what, what we will do with the bundle payment. It is now on an experimental basis uh, and they will uh, decide this year what will, uh, uh, what will be uh, yeah, uh, the next thing. Uh, it might be that we will uh, all uh, need to go over to the bundle payment and then it will be something around 2028. So still a lot of time. Um, to adapt. It's a whole transition. So the cultural change uh, is, is not there yet. Um, with Maybe within those six regions it's there, but the other 70 or 80 uh, it's not. Um, so we see some first uh, uh, effects, small changes in place of birth, uh, a smaller spending growth, but no effect on outcomes. Um, the administrative burden uh, uh, is really uh, a risk factor for uh, uh, maintaining support. It's quite 
a lot of administrative burden for uh, the IMCOs to, to get their money, to have all kinds of other uh, things. So we need to do a lot of things there. Uh, we don't know the long-term uh, uh, long effects uh, uh, of those. Um, and I think I'll, I'll keep it for there. If you are uh, really interested in alternative payment models, uh, Arthur and I have worked on a, on a course on Coursera. It's a, a massive open online course. Uh, it's free uh, to enroll where we, um, in 27 small videos, explain the concept uh, of the different APMs, uh, the why, the what, uh, and how to implement them with some kind of a, a roadmap. Uh, and then I will leave it by here, by this. Thank you very much, Jeroen. Um, yeah, so um, as you said, this was just the quantitative part. There's also still qualitative outcomes from your study that are also very interested, uh, interesting uh, to read. And you will be following up with some long-term effects. So thanks a lot for sharing uh, that uh, with us. There is a question in the chat, but I'll leave that for now and try to pick it up later. Or maybe you would like to, Jeroen, answer it immediately in the chat so everyone yes. will see uh, the answers as well. I'd like to uh, switch to uh, Marit Tanke, who uh, represents one of the big four insurance companies and share with us some experiences with trying to transform the Dutch healthcare landscape. So I'll start to introduce myself. Uh, Marit Tanke, yeah, I work now as head of strategy and innovation for VGZ, second largest uh, health insurer in the Netherlands. Um, and although I know this is a tool, um, Topic, the topic of the session is uh, alternative payment models. I am going to talk about um, how we make our financial arrangements, but I'm not going so much into the details of that, but more in what we want to achieve and how we think what type of, uh, think about what type of payment models fits best with what we want to achieve. So just as a little disclaimer, don't expect all the technical details from, uh, from me. Um, this has been said by uh, the previous speakers. Oh, do you hear the noise as well, or is that just me? I don't know what it is. Sorry. Okay, I'll just I'll try just to go on. I have no idea. Is it really annoying? Yeah, or not? No, it's fine. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so now you have read my, uh, my slides on this. Um, we're doing pretty well, but we have some uh, issues. And that's the cost, of course, but also the uh, workforce shortage that we expect, especially in, um, well, I think the estimation is that at this moment, one in seven people work in healthcare in the Netherlands. And it's estimated that that's uh, one in four in every four in 2040. So we have to do something differently. And... Um, Within uh, VGZ, the idea is that the trigger point of doing something differently is to reduce the low-value care and go to the cycle of quality. So the idea is, if you go into the cycle of quality and you make more time for the patient to truly understand what the patient needs, you improve quality with that, you do less low-value care, unnecessary treatment, and that leads to less cost. And then again, because you're not doing all these treatments that might have not been necessary in the first place, you have more time for the patient again. And that's why our focus is on appropriateness of care. And we define appropriateness as better care for the patients with avoiding overtreatment and low value care, leading to financially sustainable care, also in the future. And that's driven by professionals because we believe that we as a healthcare insurer do not know what works best in general. It's the professionals who work with the patients and work in the system day to day. They, they know a lot better than we do what actually works in this transformation. And that's why um, the motor of um, of our strategy are the good practices. And good practices are initiatives driven by professionals that um, show that it's possible by doing things differently. Um, you have actually a better experience, um, better outcomes, hopefully, um, 
is that measurable? That's not always measure, measurable, but um, at least experience is measurable and um, lower total costs. And this, this is an example of a decision aid um, where you see that, um, for example, people using this decision aid and having a discussion with their uh, professionals, with, their, um, with the professionals on whether or not to do an operation, you see that actually the number of um, operation surgeries performed drops by 22%. And patients are really satisfied with this decision. Um, what you also see is that there is a picture of a, a surgeon. And that's the really important thing. Um, as I said before, it's driven by the professionals themselves. Um, we have a network now with 12, uh, amongst others, 12 hospitals. And uh, Michelle who is in the call uh, as well. They he with his colleagues did an evaluation of what happened in two of the hospitals who joined this program with this. this and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the program later. But what we see is that in these two hospitals who work on this, um, work on this appropriate care way, you see that um, you see decrease in actually volume of care that is delivered. Um, but you see, what you also see is that the quality um, at least didn't go down. We couldn't really measure if in general it went up, but um, it didn't go down. We see that, uh, and mo one of the most important things is, is that we also see that it, the, the volume is not taken over by other hospitals. So that means that these hospitals have truly made a transformation in doing less uh, lower value care. And so, um, as I said, there has been an extensive evaluation of what happened and what is happening in these hospitals. What are the factors that contribute to this change that we see? And then we see a couple of things. Um, the intrinsically motivated professionals, we already talked about that. The program is made by the professionals. The initiatives that I, um, that I showed you are really they, they are created from the professionals themselves. We help them. I'm going to talk to you about how we do that. We help them, but it's not us, us who tell, like, this is what you have to do. Um, the professionals who develop the in initiatives are willing to be ambassador of or champion of these uh, amb uh, initiatives to their peers. So we actually help these professionals to spread the word what they're doing by um, connecting them with other professionals, by um, helping them to describe their initiatives. And you see that's really, really powerful in making the change. So you need people on, in the top of the organization who want and dare to challenge the status quo because it's quite a big shift in thinking to go from like the efficiency cycle and doing as much and more every time to the to the thinking where you really really think all the way through is this really appropriate what I'm doing is this uh, adding value or is it better if not I as a medical specialist for example treat this patient but a um, general practitioner and then and here we come to the financial agreements um, set up the necessary conditions. So for example, with the um, providers where, where we are partnering with, we have a three to five year contract um, with, a, um, with a fixed budget and some shared savings agreements. And I'll go to that later. So I was talking about a program and this is really the core of uh, what we're doing. Um, we're partner with the providers in a change program. So what happens is at the moment we have 12 hospitals, four mental health care institutions and two elderly care uh, organizations in our network. And what happens is that um, we really start an intensive program together. And together is the provider 
for example, a hospital, us as an insurer, and then often also um, people from the uh, GPs, so who work in the um, uh, quite close work quite closely together with the hospital in this in this case because um, because what we believe is that in the end you need a common goal and an alignment in the goals that you want to achieve and that means that um, it's not only a difference in different type of contracts that we have with these providers but also you see in the middle the removing of production incentives um, it's also that the providers themselves within the organization um, have a different different way of uh, re remunerating the physicians and normally in a traditional way in a in a, in a hospital that's mainly based on production and so here in these programs you see that we work together with the hospitals to remove these production incentives so that what the physicians do that do is actually aligned with the agreements that we as a healthcare insurer make with the hospital. You're now at 10 uh, minutes, Mary. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and so then the whole thing, um, the whole program is supported by the financial arrangements. Um, because if you go to the really traditional financial arrangements um, in the Netherlands, if we look at hospitals, there is this focus on production. You do more, you get more, generally speaking. So what we do in this case, um, we go into multi-year contracts to, um, to, to create a time also, eh? to create a time to make this transformation, because it's quite a large transformation if you reduce your volume uh, with about um, uh, seven to ten percent maybe so multi-year um, contracts with uh, a fixed budget and a shared savings agreement and but we say well in the exchange you want a maximum effort on transparency to really really work together to understand create implement these initiatives and another reason that we want that is because um, it doesn't stop with just this network. Here you see the, the, um, the providers who are part of the network. And with those providers, we have these, these really thorough programs. But what we then do is we use the initiatives and the lessons learned to help the other providers um, in our regular contracting process to share these initiatives with them um, and to help them actually also um, implement them them to um, yeah spread the appropriate care movement and um, with that we're just really happy and proud that um, that it works and that there are so many so many professionals who really want to do it differently and and we see it as all our role to, our role to to support them so that's that's it for now thank you Thank you very much, uh, Marit. I think you also um, echo the message that Jeroen gave. It should start with the goals and then the financial arrangements uh, should support uh, the goals that you, uh, that you try to uh, uh, achieve. Um, if you can stop sharing, then uh, Arthur can get his uh, presentation ready. So uh, thanks a lot. And uh, Arthur also represents one of the bigger four uh, insurance companies in the Netherlands. Yeah, great. So my name is Arthur Heijn. In the next couple of minutes, I will tell you a little bit more about the health insurance perspective on value-based payment. Um, I'm here on behalf of Bensys, which is one of the largest Dutch health insurance companies. Uh, we currently provide health insurance to over 2 million insured. Well, one of the most important insights that we gained over the past years was that although we want that our care providers provide value to our patients, uh, we don't explicitly acknowledge that in the way we pay our care providers. So care providers that provide more value to our patients, they earn as much as care providers who uh, do a, a, a much worse job in this. So at one point we thought, well, if value is so important to us, we must acknowledge that in the way in which we pay our providers. So we must make these payment models value-based by infusing them with value-based incentives. Um, because now, uh, like Eric said in the introduction, the way in which we pay our care providers is volume-based. 
Well, we not only think that uh, value-based payments uh, will improve quality, we also think that it can foster learning and innovation. And why is that? Well, we think that uh, if you as a provider have a good idea about how you can improve value for patients, it can really help to complete your business case, your financial business case, when you can tell your, uh, uh, your, the party who finances you that you will actually um, get a return on uh, the investment, right? Because it actually costs money um, to uh, organize healthcare in a value-based way. So our goal with um, these payment models that we introduced, and I will tell you about this in a minute, uh, is not only to um, uh, uh, shift the quality curve to the right, but also narrowing it uh, simply as a result of this increased innovation. So we basically also uh, use uh, value-based payments to um, uh, uh, lower variation uh, between care providers. That's our ultimate goal. So as you can imagine, um, because of this insight, the value-based payment it has actually taken center stage in our purchasing policy in, uh, in the past couple of years. So over the past couple of years, we designed uh, value-based payment models for hip and knee surgery, but also, and I think this is very interesting, also for mental health care, so for depression and anxiety. Uh, and the complex thing over there was uh, uh, to measure what quality actually is. And we also uh, developed a value-based payment model for GP care, and I will uh, tell you a little bit more about that in the coming slides. Well, first of all, uh, how do these value-based payment models look like? I try to visualize this here. So starting from the upper right, we start with uh, the volume-based payment as a basis for our model. So that means that care providers who uh, participate in our uh, models, they continue to bill uh, 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 like they used to do before. But we complement this volume-based payment system in uh, a number of ways. So the first component is that we introduce a shared savings arrangement. And a shared savings arrangement means that, healthcare that, that providers can share in savings they make in healthcare expenditures. And in order to determine whether a provider has realized savings, we measure its own uh, historical expenditures. We multiply these uh, historical expenditures with a current national growth trend. And if you beat this benchmark as a care provider, then you can share in the expenditure savings, but only conditionally on achieving uh, uh, quality uh, uh, targets, right? So I think this is very nice because this is a nice way of actually tying incentives for both cost containment and quality or quality improvement together. Well, on top of this payment model, we also organize uh, workshops uh, during which uh, care providers actually uh, get an idea of what they are doing wrong, of where they can improve, and during which they also share best practices. So let me tell you about one particular model um, uh, that we implemented over the past year, and I'm I chose this model because we actually evaluated this quite rigorously, uh, and it's a shared savings model for GP care. So what exactly is a shared savings model again? Uh, under a shared savings model, we hold one provider accountable for total healthcare expenditures. In this experiment, it was a GP, so a, a primary care provider. And if this primary care provider manages to reduce healthcare expenditures, for example, by substituting for hospital care, uh, by substituting uh, branded medicines for, ge for generic ones, uh, or for example, by um, uh, only ordering diagnostic tests when they are really uh, related to the complaint, etc. If a GP manages to lower these expenditures, he will share in the savings um, uh, um, with the, the health insurer. So we actually uh, designed this model and we implemented it. And uh, in this pilot, eight GP practices participated, and this pilot was held in the city of Enschede, which is a middle-sized city in the Netherlands. Uh, I think there are about 200,000 inhabitants. Um, and the GPs that participated in the experiment, they could earn part of the savings in healthcare expenditures. Altogether, well, these GP practices, they took care of over 15,000 insurance and release. Um, and the pilot ran from July 2014 to July 2016. Well, this is some time ago, but I think it's still relevant to present the results here because um, shared savings models are still not common, right? So this still is a very special uh, pilot in that respect. So what were the results? Well, uh, similar to uh, Jeroen's evaluation of um, uh, like what he discussed in his presentation, we used the difference in difference design to um, uh, estimate the causal impact of uh, the new payment model on healthcare expenditures. And the first year results, they showed that there was a 3.5% drop in total healthcare expenditures. Well, how were these, these savings realized? Well, we found in a sub-analysis that it was primarily a volume effect, meaning that GPs sent fewer people 
uh, to the hospital. So, for example, by uh, uh, substituting for hospital care. Um, we also saw that the, uh, the, 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 the savings were largely concentrated in hospital care, as you can see in, the, in this table on the right. Also makes sense because, well, uh, the hospitals are responsible for over, I think, 50% of the total health expenditures. So it makes sense that we also find the largest effect here. And I think what is really uh, interesting here, and this also closely resembles the, fi the figure that Jeroen showed, that every GP that participated in the pilot realized savings. Well, for GP number two, it's not statistically significant, but like borderline significant. But every GP that participated um, realized savings. So this really helps us in uh, uh, asserting that there is a causal, um, uh, uh, a causal impact of payment reform and healthcare expenditures. Well, on to quality. Um, we uh, investigated lots of quality indicators, but we didn't really find uh, an effect here. Um, these are the results uh, uh, that we got from holding a patient inquiry uh, right before and after uh, the introduction of the payment model. And you don't see really a big difference. Um, the interesting thing is that we added some uh, questions to this inquiry uh, that could address the perverse incentives that follow from a shared savings model. Uh, for example, you can imagine that it's quite easy to realize savings when you simply close down your office because then nobody uh, can come by uh, uh, to, to get care. So we really asked the patients like, um, uh, what is the ease with which you could make an appointment? Uh, do you understand the treatment decision, right? So uh, we also had this fear that uh, um, uh, GPs would, would, would uh, under provide healthcare, but we didn't find any evidence for this, at least uh, in the patient inquiry. So, Given that the quality uh, remained constant and given that we had such a large uh, decrease in health expenditures, we concluded that uh, payment reform in this case was a way to enhance value in healthcare. So the first results, they are promising, but I think there are several barriers that uh, kind of uh, prevent us from unleashing a greater potential. So the first one, uh, and uh, uh, Jeroen also mentioned this in his presentation. So. And uh, the first thing that I was wondering is, is are we really talking about provider payment reform? Uh, and the reason why I'm asking is, as a health insurer, we conclude contracts with a provider organization, such as a hospital, for example. Um, but we do not conclude a contract with, for example, individual specialists or individual GPs. And it's not at all clear that the incentives that follow from the hospital contract uh, are translated uh, uh, to the workforce as well, right? So in fact, we actually find that oftentimes specialists and GPs, uh, they work under different incentives than the hospital that we contract. So I think that we can even get uh, better results if we pay closer attention to the way in which hospitals transform uh, uh, contractual incentives to the workforce. <clears throat> well, the second barrier is that um, uh, the Dutch healthcare system is quite fragmented. So that means that uh, in some parts of the healthcare system, there might be some countervailing incentives, right? So for a GP, it will be very difficult to realize savings when the hospital, in turn, is on a fee-for-service uh, contract. Another barrier is the low uh, billing uh, is the long billing time. Well, we want to give immediate feedback on uh, performance, uh, but it takes quite long before we have the bill. So it takes like a year um, uh, before we can calculate the real uh, 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 savings here. Uh, so that reduces incentive strength uh, this time. That's what we know from the economic literature. Then second to last is the privacy law. When uh, uh, providers participate um, in, uh, in an experiment, they ideally want to know on, in which they, domains they can improve. Well, for that you need data, of course. Uh, and providers basically say, well, um, I want to have data, but it, it's, it's basically not allowed for them to, to see these data and to uh, uh, receive these data. And for us as health insurers, it's also not allowed to, to send these data in, in the first place. Because ideally, for example, I want, to, uh, I want to explain to the GP who his most expensive patients are and what goes wrong with these patients, but are simply not allowed to share these data with the GPs. And I think if there would be a clear framework um, uh, for uh, health insurers or even like better possibilities for sharing data, then we, can, then we can unleash an even greater potential uh, uh, from a value-based payment. The last thing that I want to point out is this nice paradox. Um, uh, currently in the Netherlands, in, in some parts of the Netherlands, we have a labor shortage and the provider organizations that are participating in our, in, in our experiments, they say, well, uh, we, cannot re we cannot really realize savings now or we cannot really work on value-based healthcare because 
we are working so much on solving this labor shortage, right? But I think what this labor shortage should ideally cre create a momentum for value-based healthcare instead, right? But it seems like uh, it seems like a paradox. But the thing here, uh, to uh, well. I think what we can learn from this is, is that it actually costs uh, uh, money to work on value-based healthcare and costs time, right? Well, I think the same holds um, for this corona area in which we uh, in which we currently live. Um, this should really create a momentum for value-based healthcare because uh, hospitals really need to uh, catch up with the uh, postponed demand. Uh, and I think the only way in which they can solve this is to uh, have a better look at the value and just give priority to, to value-based healthcare first now. But it also means for health insurance that we should um, uh, uh, change our contracts with hospitals uh, accordingly. So that's it for now. That is exactly 12 minutes, Arthur. I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, excellent. Um, yeah, so I already see a couple of uh, general themes arising from the presentations, but I'll first ask Frank to uh, share uh, his views uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, scientific research into this area. And uh, I'm sure we'll have some minutes to uh, also draw some conclusions. I'm also very happy with how questions are being answered in the chat. So I hope that you've also found the chat, both audience and speakers, uh, because uh, we can already uh, uh, solve a lot of uh, questions uh, online and in the chat. Frank, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Can you see the screen? Is yes, and we hear you. Okay. So thanks again, Eric, for organizing this and for the opportunity to contribute to this nice session. So I will focus on the question, what can we learn from the scientific evidence or research on alternative provider payment models in the Netherlands, but also elsewhere? And I think a lot has already been said, so I might be skipping some slides here and there to avoid being too repetitive, but we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> so when we talk about APMs, I think there are several uh, useful frameworks out there that can help with categorizing these models. And I think Jeroen already showed an, uh, an interesting one. Uh, but for this presentation, I will use a slightly different categorization, which is that between pay for performance, uh, condition level payments, which I call bundled payments, and finally, global or population based payments. So P4P, pay for performance, simply means explicitly rewarding or penalizing providers based on their measured performance using indicators. And preferably, of course, those are outcome indicators. And this is usually done through add-on payments to the existing payment structure, which tends to be a fee-for-service constellation still. Then bundled payment goes a step further and involves a single payment at the condition level, the medical condition level, with providers accepting accountability for, in principle, all care related to a certain condition, and I deliberately say in principle, and I'll come back to that later on. And finally, global payment is probably the most far-reaching type of APM, as providers assume accountability for a care package that transcends single conditions. So it's really about that whole person accountability approach here. And of course, these APM times can and often are combined in a single APM payment constellation. Well, a lot has already been written about what these types of APMs can or should be able to, uh, to accomplish in theory. And as we've seen before, and also becomes clear from these Dutch headlines uh, from news sites and, uh, and newspapers, there's also quite some experimentation going on in the Netherlands. But I must admit, Overall, the progress has been relatively limited overall. And this is also what the Dutch Healthcare Authority concluded in a recent report about hospital insurer contracts. And this is a quote from that report. So overall, there are still few contracts uh, in which APMs are included. And actually the volume incentive from the fee-for-service payment models is still quite prominently there in these contracts. 
what's not in this quote, but what is the case, I think, is that for the APMs that have been going on, they're still limited insight in their effects. And of course, there are exceptions like the examples of Jeroen and the example of Arthur. But in general, there's limited insight in what these APMs uh, are achieving. So for this talk, I had to resort mainly, but not entirely, but mainly to the international evidence on APMs. And starting with pay for performance, or briefly P4P, and perhaps somewhat surprisingly, given the intuitive appeal of pay for performance, is that its effectiveness hasn't really been confirmed yet in the literature, even though it has been around for several decades now. And these two review articles clearly show that. So despite some improvements in care processes, the evidence is not really convincing yet. And as concluded by Aaron Mendelssohn and colleagues, positive associations with improved outcomes, which ultimately is of course the end goal, has not been demonstrated, not in any setting. And there have been papers trying to unravel the reasons for these disappointing results, which might first of all relate to flaws in the design of these programs from a behavioral economics perspective, for example, but also the fact that implementation is quite complex with the context and details being very important. <clears throat> and this last point, I think is illustrated very nicely by these two studies. And both studies report on a very similar hospital P4P program, but, and there's the, the interesting part, implemented in different settings, namely US Medicare, the example on the left, and the Northwest region of England on the right. So despite both initiatives being very similar in terms of the indicators used and the conditions uh, being focused upon and the design of the incentives, their impact on mortality in this case differed tremendously. And I think this probably had at least something to do with the details of the context, details and the context of the implementation process. So summarizing the, the lessons from the literature on pay for performance, uh, and that's mainly the international literature again. Um, I already mentioned, I think, the first two lessons, and of course, the third one is also important. So be cautious of unintended consequences of pay for performance, like providers focusing disproportionately on the things being measured and for which they receive rewards. Uh, but I think the fourth lesson is probably the most important one in this respect, because as I said before, P4P tends to be applied as an add on to the existing payment structure, which tends to be fee-for-service or some variant thereof. And because this add-on will inevitably comprise just a small portion of providers' total income or revenue, the incentives in the underlying fee-for-service system will play a much larger role, expectedly so, in providers' behavior than the additional P4P incentives. So I think, therefore, that it's crucial for APMs to also account, whoops, sorry, to also account for the underlying incentives in the underlying payment system. And I think research shows that when this is done, results indeed become more positive. And that brings me to the other two APM types that I introduced before, so the bundle payment and global payments. And the one on the left was already shown by Jeroen, so he was uh, the lead author of that review. And uh, in these two literature reviews, the evidence is summarized. And although, of course, more research is always needed, the available evidence shows promising results in terms of reduced spending growth, and sometimes also equal or better even quality. So not really spectacular, but nevertheless quite positive overall, at least as compared to pay for performance, for example. Then I think I have a couple of minutes left and I also have a couple of slides left on the Dutch experience that I know of at least. So starting with bundled payments and actually bundled payments have been around for quite some time now, starting with several chronic conditions nationwide in 2010, mainly in primary care and more recently for other conditions and hospital treatments as well. And Arthur already showed some of those. 
And there have been some research on the primary cat bundles for chronic conditions. And among the positive findings are improvements, first of all, in care coordination. So the way in which providers collaborate with each other and coordinate care. And also more transparency due to better record keeping, for example, which in turn allowed for setting performance benchmarks and also as input for quality improvement projects. But on the other hand, there have been no convincing signs, at least to my knowledge, of a cost reduction and quality improvement in these programs, insofar this was studied at all. And there have also been some remaining concerns, for example, about an increased administrative burden, and secondly, also on how to deal with patients with coexisting conditions, because bundled payment is a condition-specific payment, and that's maybe a difficulty when patients have multiple conditions and would benefit especially from a holistic approach to their care. Then how about the more recent bundled payment initiatives in Dutch hospitals? Again, not that much evidence, perhaps the maternity care bundles being the, the sole exception here. Uh, but there has been a recent qualitative study that I was involved in, and also case uh, case I was involved in. And one of the lessons is that in almost none of the initiatives they have succeeded in integrating care across the entire cycle of care for the condition. So, so far the focus has been on bundling hospital care only. And I think one of the reasons is the perceived complexity by the stakeholders resulting in the initiatives to deliberately start small with only bundling care in the hospital. Uh, and another reason, which is also relevant more generally, and Arthur already talked a little bit about this, are barriers related to existing regulation and mainly privacy regulation, which hinders data sharing among providers. And also another barrier are the so-called fences or these boundaries between subsectors like primary care and hospital care. And with that, I, for example, mean that IT systems aren't able to speak to each other, but also cultural differences and conflicting financial incentives that are still there. Well, we've also identified factors that facilitated the introduction of bundled payment, and these include multi-year agreements, first of all, in which stakeholders, so payers, providers, and also among the providers themselves, can work on a shared vision and a long-term commitment. Second of all, a broad felt sense of urgency, so really the intrinsic motivation to start engaging with these alternative payment models, with the idea to improve care, of course. Thirdly, to start small uh, and not perhaps being too ambitious from the start, so accepting that it will take time and multi-year agreements also help with that. And finally, sufficient patient volume, so both for providers to be able to spread risk and for making the program also attractive financially to participate in for providers. Yes, and, and for the most part, the quantitative impact on cost and quality is not yet known, but this will change in the near future because some evaluations are underway, actually. So stay tuned. You're now at 11 minutes, Frank. Okay, that will, uh, that will work nicely. Well, then finally, how about global payment? Well, I can be short here because there's simply no or almost no experience yet. So this whole person accountability idea. And again, this might have something to do with several barriers like the ones identified in this qualitative study. And APMs were parts of the initial plans of these population health management sites, but they were ultimately quite small scale and you cannot really speak of a global payment arrangement in these pilot sites. And among the identified barriers are information asymmetry between stakeholders, a lack of trust also, both between payer and providers, but also among the providers involved themselves. And again, no real sense of urgency to actively engage in payment reform or APMs in general. And that brings me to my final slide. So some key challenges when it comes to payment reform. And these are in random order, except perhaps for the first one, which in my mind is the key challenge to tackle in the coming years. And that probably also holds for many other countries. So I think I don't have time to discuss the other ones uh, in depth, but that's not really a problem as they've been touched upon anyways in this talk or in the previous presentation. So instead, I will stop there. 
thank you for listening and uh, stay tuned because more is yet to come in the coming weeks. Thanks. Thanks. What a nice way to end because the more that is yet to come, of course, will come from healthcare insurers, other purchasers in the system, uh, supported by regulatory bodies, uh, etc. So uh, all the speakers that you've been listening to will be part of what is yet to come in terms of alternative payment methods in the Netherlands. Um, I just want to make sure one thing, and perhaps I need Federica for that. I know that at 12 o'clock we have to be vacating this virtual room because this room will be used for something else. But I also know that at 12, there is another room reserved for networking. Federica, is that available to everyone who is now also in this session? That is very correct. We are going to open uh, a room in about eight minutes for you to connect with uh, the speakers, the attendees. Uh, it's absolutely not mandatory, but of course, it's a nice way to, you know, have the microphone on and, and connect and ask some additional questions. So, so you're all more than welcome to join that. And how will the audience members know what link to follow to get there? Uh, so you can go on the web app and uh, in the program of today among the networking sessions, uh, you will see that it's called, uh, it's exactly the title of this session and then followed by post networking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not all speakers can be there. I know that Frank has educational obligations to uh, attend at 12, but I will be there and any speaker who can make it will also be there. Uh, again, very happy that a lot of questions are also being uh, answered uh, in the chat. Um, I see uh, some very interesting, uh, yeah, you could say conclusions arise from uh, what we have been discussing. Um, one is that uh, in terms of effects of APMs, uh, we quite often see that the quality effect is either not there or uh, as yet unmeasured. So uh, quality is being measured and then it seems to remain uh, constant. But uh, there could also be, of course, unmeasured effects that we uh, don't yet know of. But we also see that a lot of experiments lead to um, a clear effect on expenses, on expenditure. We see cost savings as a result of APMs. So still a lot of work to do there uh, just to make sure that there are no unmeasured negative, negative impacts on quality and uh, maybe we will also discover some unmeasured positive effects of, of APMs. Um, another observation I had listening to the different presentations is that APMs typically impact the provider organization. And uh, this uh, raises the question of how uh, and if it also impacts the professional, the individual professional. And uh, I think in the presentation by Marit Tanke, it was quite, quite clear huh, how important the role of the individual professional is in uh, uh, enabling this transformation of care. Um, so we need to be aware of that relationship. Uh, the, the, the incentive stemming from APMs should flow from the purchaser to the provider organization and on to the professional if our goal is to change the behavior of that individual professional. The third thing I was thinking of when listening to the presentations is, hey, we now talk about APMs and the P stands for payment. Um, maybe we should also think about, is there a way that we can broaden this to alternative reward methods and then also think about non-financial rewards. And if we can um, uh, establish interesting blends of financial incentives and may, maybe also non-financial rewards, and how these non-financial rewards trigger intrinsic motivation and trigger uh, behavioral changes uh, of healthcare professionals. So I think that would also be uh, uh, an interesting uh, development. And maybe one of the speakers would like to respond to that last remark. Should we also start thinking about ARMs and not just APMs? Yeah, yeah. Can I can I say something about that? Because yeah, I think that amazingly important. Um, for example, what I told you about, so the professional and elite, but one of the, the, the things that responds best with the, the professionals is, it is the money, of course, because that gives financial sustainability, but it's even more to have your photo on this initiative of this good practice, 
and then to be able to show your colleagues that hey this is what we do this is how i drive a transformation um also we have this yearly award with 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 videos and and that is really what uh, i think last year or two years ago we had one of those in our commercial the end of year commercial and then other people came to us and asked okay what do we have to do to to be able to get into the commercial also like next year so i think for professionals what we see it it, it is like the financial part is the basis you really need it but then on top of that to really get the motivation it's more about the non-financial things as well Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's also maybe a, a theme we can uh, elaborate on in the, the room that we will move to uh, in a couple of minutes. Maybe a question that uh, Misha would like to uh, quickly reflect upon. Do you think we need specifically Dutch APMs because the context is so important? We've heard that in a couple of presentations. Can we just borrow from the literature and, and use it in the Netherlands or do we need specifically Dutch APMs? Um, as uh, I agree with uh, Frank when he said that uh, uh, these APMs or ARMs, if you would like, um, are very uh, con context uh, specific and the details uh, matter. Uh, for example, we do this uh, different regional experiments, and, and the reason for and the motivation for a region as Amsterdam is quite different than a region as uh, Zealand. In Zealand, uh, the main driver is a, a staff shortage. Well, in Amsterdam, uh, it's very fast growing, uh, so money's coming in, so they have the luxury to uh, do different things and to experiment. So I, I think that uh, although elements are clear, as all, uh, all speakers also indicated, uh, but uh, the details and specific context matter. May I, may I elaborate on that, Eric? Yeah, yeah, you have one more minute. Uh, okay, uh, I agree the context is, is, is essential, but I still believe that there is an, an, some kind of international cross-nation learning possible in the sense that the mechanism and, and uh, how we should incentivize providers, I think, are similar. And we did a quite in-depth uh, dive of alternative quality contract in, in, the, uh, in the US, the AQC. Uh, and I think... It, uh, um, a large part of those uh, are applied in uh, the presentation of Arthur with the Arts and Zorg uh, um, uh, contract. So there are uh, for sure the generic lessons, but they are more on the level of a mechanism, uh, how to incentivize, uh, how do we measure quality, um, and then you have to, to adapt to your local setting. I would like to thank, first of all, the speakers, um, but I'll talk to most of you in a minute. And then I would like to thank the audience. Thank you for being here, for your participation, the interesting questions. And I'm sure we'll run into each other for the remainder of the conference. So thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>